Let's talk about how a USPTO examiner examines your patent claims when your patent application is filed. So there are two types of claims in a patent application generally. Those are independent claims and dependent claims. For more information about the structure of those claims and the difference between independent and dependent claims, see my video on claim structure here. So what does the USPTO examiner do when they receive your patent application and now they have to process it? They're going to look for what's called prior art. They're going to look at the limitations of your claims as your patent attorney has drafted or as you have drafted if you're filing the patent application yourself. And they're going to look to that prior art to find those limitations. So for the examiner to do a novelty rejection, novelty is under 35 USC section 102 of the patent law. For the examiner to be able to make a 102 novelty rejection against your independent claim, the patent examiner has to find all limitations in a prior art reference. So in some patent that the examiner finds, and it doesn't have to be a patent, it can be a patent application publication, it can be a technical paper, it could be a catalog, it can be anything that shows the limitations of your invention and that has a date prior to your filing date of your patent application. So the examiner finds this prior art and looks at the prior art to see if those limitations are present. So if the examiner finds that this reference teaches a first widget, a second widget that's connected to the first widget, and a gadget connected to the first widget and the second widget, then the examiner can reject your claim one under 35 USC 102 for lack of novelty. Now, there's another type of rejection that the examiner can make of your patent claim, and that's obviousness. How does an obviousness rejection get formulated? So usually when the examiner makes an obviousness rejection, and by the way, an obviousness rejection is under 35 USC section 103 of the patent law. So novelty is under section 102, obviousness is under section 103. In the case of obviousness, in most situations, the patent examiner found a reference, but the reference does not teach all the limitations of your independent claim. So for example, the examiner may have found a patent that teaches a first widget and a second widget connected to the first widget. So these two limitations would be taught by the first reference. So the examiner can't make a novelty rejection against your claim because the cited prior art reference would have to teach all limitations of your claim, but it doesn't. So what the examiner does is looks for a, another reference. And I'm going to explain this in terms of two references. However, the examiner can use multiple references in a 103 rejection. It can be three, four, five, or so on and so forth. So the examiner finds a second reference. So this is reference number one, and this is reference number two. So the examiner finds the second reference that teaches the gadget that's connected to the first widget and the second widget. However, because it's in another reference than the first reference, there isn't going to be a clear teaching that it's connected to the first widget and the second widget because that's taught in a second reference. So what the examiner has to do is make an argument that it would be obvious for a person of ordinary skill in the art to look at these two references and to combine them in such a way that the gadget that's taught by the second reference is connected to the first and second widget taught by the first reference. And in addition to making that argument, the examiner also has to argue that there would be some motivation to make that combination. And the motivation, by the way, does not have to be the same motivation that you had when you created your invention. So when you created your invention, you did it to fulfill a specific purpose. 
your invention solves some specific problem and whatever that purpose is, that may not be the same purpose that's being solved by reference one or reference two. They may solve completely different purposes and the examiner can argue that the combination of reference one and reference two solve a different problem or are combinable for a different purpose than your invention. But nevertheless, by making the combination, you wind up having the limitations of your independent claim. So by making the combination of reference one, which teaches the first widget and the second widget, with reference two, which teaches the gadget, one of ordinary skill in the art would have known that by connecting these three elements together, they would arrive at something that solves some type of a purpose, that solves some type of a problem. And again, not necessarily the problem you are solving with your invention. So how do you argue against the novelty rejection? When you get a novelty rejection, the first thing you need to do is to analyze in detail the cited reference. You need to read it and you usually need to read it in terms of the specification from cover to cover. You need to read the entirety of the specification. You need to make a determination if the examiner, who will usually cite to a portion of that reference by paragraph or line number, depending on the structure of the document. For patent application publications, they're arranged by paragraphs. A patent is arranged by columns and, and line numbers. So the examiner citing a patent will cite to a column and line numbers of that patent. Citing to a publication may only cite the paragraph number and you have to read the entire paragraph. So as you read through that, you have to see if you agree with the examiner from the technical aspect. This is not a legal analysis at this point. This is a technical analysis. You have to see if the examiner understood what that reference was actually teaching and if the examiner's interpretation of that teaching is correct. That's the first thing. But you also need to look to see how the examiner is interpreting your claim and if the examiner is interpreting your claim in light of your specification. So the examiner has to perform a function that's referred to as claim construction. Now, claim construction can also happen in a court during an infringement proceeding where the court and the jury are trying to determine whether your patent is infringed by an accused infringing device. This claim construction is a little bit different. The examiner does a claim construction using what's called the broadest reasonable interpretation or B R I, the broadest reasonable interpretation. Now the broadest reasonable interpretation still has to be done in light of your specification. So what does that mean? It means that the examiner has to look to your specification and determine if the claim terms can be interpreted more broadly or if they need a narrower interpretation that's defined within the body of your specification. So. For example, the first widget. Well, what is a first widget? The first widget in your specification should be defined. There should be some diagram. You're going to have in your patent diagrams, you're going to have at least a figure that shows the first widget and the second widget. It's going to show that they're connected and it's going to have the gadget and it's going to show that that gadget is connected to both the first widget and the second widget. That diagram in your patent application is legal support in conjunction with the written description portion. It forms legal support for your claim subject matter. So you need to have that diagram to support this claim and you need to have text in the specification that describes the diagram in such a way that not only supports the claim, but also that enables a person of ordinary skill in the art, a person having ordinary skill in the art to Fozita, to be able to make and use your invention. So getting back to the 102 novelty rejection, the examiner is looking for these limitations in that reference. And if you can determine that the examiner 
either made a mistake and that reference doesn't teach the widget, doesn't teach the first widget, second widget, and the gadget, or maybe it teaches the widget and it teaches the first widget and the second widget, but maybe it doesn't teach the gadget connected to the first widget and the second widget. In that case, the 102 novelty rejection would be improper and your patent attorney or you, if you're arguing your patent by yourself, would argue that the examiner made a mistake, that the cited reference does not teach what the examiner is alleging and that there was a misunderstanding. And hopefully the examiner will understand that argument, agree with the argument, and then in the next office action, this 102 rejection of claim one will go away. But the examiner may find another grounds for rejection. So generally, in terms of a novelty 102 rejection, this is the approach that you would take to try to overcome that rejection. You would try to find that the reference doesn't teach what the examiner is alleging that it teaches, or that the examiner has misinterpreted your claim, hasn't interpreted it in light of the specification. Of course, the examiner is using a very broad interpretation. It's the broadest reasonable interpretation, but it has to be reasonable. How do you know if the examiner's interpretation is unreasonable? Well, it's a case-by-case -case basis determination, but to give kind of a rough example of what might be unreasonable, say that the widget is an electronic device of some sort, and the examiner, instead of interpreting that widget as an electronic device that's connected, interprets it as some type of a pneumatic device that's connected to the other widget. That may be an unreasonable interpretation. Another example might be if you have one limitation of your claim that's made out of a certain material like neoprene rubber and the examiner interprets that component as being made of leather, that leather might not work for the application that you're proposing. And so that may be an unreasonable interpretation in light of your specification. But again, these are just high level examples and the determination of reasonableness has to be done on a case by case basis. And it has to be based upon what's written in the specification and how you're describing the limitations that are present in your claims and how you're defining the terms that are used in those claim limitations. What about 103 rejections? How would you overcome a 103 rejection? So a 103 rejection has one aspect that's similar to a 102 rejection, which is the references that are cited, even though they're being used in, in an obviousness rejection, they still have to together show all the limitations of your claim. So the obviousness rejection is not complete if the examiner didn't find that one reference teaches a certain set of limitations of your claim and the other reference or references teach the remaining limitations of your claim. So all the limitations have to be found in the references in one form or another. So one way to try to overcome the 103 obviousness rejection is to argue in a similar manner to the way you would argue in a 102 rejection after you've done sufficient analysis. So you, the analysis portion is you have to read the references to determine if the examiner, in the sense of the technical interpretation of those sections that are being cited, actually teach the subject matter that the examiner is alleging that they teach. If they do, then you may have a difficulty. However, if they don't, then you can argue that the reference doesn't teach what's, what is alleged by the examiner. So what does that mean? If the examiner m misinterpreted the reference and found that, although maybe you agree that the reference teaches the first widget, but you don't agree with the examiner that that reference teaches the second widget, well, then the combination of the references would fail to arrive at the claim subject matter because if reference one only has the first widget, but not the second widget, and reference two has the gadget, but not the second widget also, by the way, if you look at the first reference and find that it doesn't teach all the subject matter that the examiner alleged, 
you also have to make sure that the other references cited don't teach that subject matter. So in this case, in this example, let's say that reference two doesn't teach the second widget and reference one, which the examiner cited as teaching the first widget and the second widget, does teach the first widget, but doesn't teach the second widget. The second reference that the examiner cited teaches the gadget, but not the second widget. Now you can argue in that case that the 103 rejection is improper and that the combination would fail because there's an element missing. It doesn't have the second widget. So combining the two references can't arrive at your claim subject matter. It doesn't teach all of the subject matter necessary to arrive at the claim. So that's one basic way to overcome an obviousness rejection.